Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live stream for today. We are excited to be here with you. Uh, my name is Matthew. I am one of the course staff uh, for our online class and uh, also do a bunch of stuff with our online programs here. Um, I'm going to let uh, Chris, I'm going to let you say hello and uh, welcome everybody, and then we will get started with questions from the chat. everyone can hear me but and ask for your patience that's a little technical problem i have with this battery question unfortunately All right, hello everyone. I believe we are now back and actually running this time. My apologies for the confusion we had, uh, as you know, sometimes happens with these things, a technical difficulty. But we are back and running. Welcome to the live session. Uh, my name is Matthew. I am one of the course staff, and I help with with a bunch of the online things. So um, we are um, happy to be here with you today. Um, all sorts of exciting space news going on. Um, I'm going to let Chris uh, say hello and welcome, and then we will get going with your questions. Uh, please ask those in the chat or send them to the email, um, and we'll get going. Okay. Welcome, everyone. We've got a slightly late start, so let's go. Okay. So the first question for today is from Ayush, who asks, how is it possible for James Webb to record light from the center of the galaxy? And if so, how much time will it take since light takes many years to reach us? And what information will we gather from that data? Uh, yes, James Webb Space Telescope is, is very good at looking at the center of our galaxy. Um, remember that we live in a spiral galaxy and we're in the disk of the galaxy. So when you see the Milky Way on the sky, we're looking through, uh, although it's very thinly distributed, we're looking through a lot of gas and dust between us and the center of our galaxy. For optical light, 
that is uh, um, that it reddens and extinguishes optical light. Uh, essentially, one out of a billion photons from the very center of our galaxy reaches us here um, in our spiral arm of the Milky Way. So the center of our galaxy is essentially opaque to visible light. Uh, but longer wavelengths are, are less affected by dust and gas, and so they travel freely. So it, you need an infrared telescope like James Webb to see to the center of our galaxy, uh, which is about 28,000 light years away. So this is a telescope, as are all infrared telescopes, that's very well suited to studying the center of the galaxy. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Lawrence K. Professor, in the double slit experiment, you shoot a single photon at a barrier screen. Will you get an interference pattern on the detector screen? If so, does the single photon have less than one wave function? Or greater than one wave function, I'm sorry. Yeah, the double slit experiment is a is an interesting uh, thought experiment, but you can actually do it now. We can make single photon experiments um, to demonstrate the issues of quantum probability. Um, so if you just shine a lot of light uh, through a single slit and then it reaches two other slits and then to a screen, you'll see interference patterns from the two slits, um, light and dark bands basically on the projection screen. In the thought experiment where you slow down the rate of light till only one photon is being emitted, then that photon will either will go through one or the other slits and then head to the projection screen. In principle, a single photon may be diffracted, but it will travel mostly in a straight line to the projection screen. Um, so one photon cannot create an interference pattern. You need many photons to see that. And so the interesting thing is that even if you slow this experiment down to one photon per second, so you watch each one doing its thing, the cumulative effect of the photons is still to participate in an interference pattern, as you would see with large amounts of light. So each photon does indeed have a probability function to describe its position and to describe what happens to it when it reaches an obstacle like a slit, because diffraction uh, is a quantum wave phenomenon. Excellent, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next question is from Wendy Traver, um, who uh, says, you spoke about the isotropic, uh, isotopic mismatch between ices from comets and water on Earth, but isn't there a significant amount of both hydrogen and deuterium on Earth, and doesn't the ratio vary over time? Uh, is this a focus of study? Uh, yes, there's uh, the isotopic ratio of, of normal water, if you like, and heavy water, deuterated water. Um, is, a, is an amount that has varied over time. We only have indirect measurements, of course, of it through the history of the Earth. And the, where the water on the Earth has been is a matter for some debate. Um, in fact, the presence of water on the Earth's surface possibly emerging from the deep mantle um, is, a, is a viable hypothesis for where the Earth got most of its water. And we have no way of, of testing the deuterated fraction of water in the deep mantle. We, we can't dig that deep into the Earth. So this fact that there's a mismatch with the very small, just a handful of measurements uh, of cometary material um, is not a killer to the idea that the water was brought in from outside. Uh, at the moment, the research is ambiguous because we simply don't have information on the deuterated water ratio in the early Earth's history. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you very much. The next question is from one of our live participants um, who would like to know, uh, Ranganathan, uh, or sorry, Ramani Ranganathan would like to know, uh, Professor, when do we expect the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope? Uh, it's a couple of months away, actually. So this, this is a very slow process. Uh, we've seen the su great success of the James Webb Telescope uh, unfurling its solar panels and erecting its mirrors into a rigid structure. So the telescope is complete. Um, but there's a long process of getting the detectors through their uh, calibration and test phases and of doing in a sort of long iterative process the focusing of the telescope itself and all the mirrors. Uh, so before it could make any, a sharp image at all, there's weeks and weeks of testing like that. And there's also the similar amount of testing of the detectors themselves. So best guesses are that these will not probably be images released to the public because they won't look very good at the beginning. But the telescope will start making images 
uh, in terms of engineering and test data probably in a month and a half, two months. Uh, and then it'll be this painful process of optimizing the focus, optimizing the performance conditions of the instruments, uh, getting them at their operating temperature and so on. Uh, and so it's probably about four or five months, people expect four or five months before the first test images are released to the public. And I'm going to be posting a website, a NASA website, that gives uh, the current status of JWST uh, in the chat. Um, so if you want to see exactly what is going on um, currently, it's a fantastic, I follow it, I check in on it every day, and I just kind of follow what's going on. Um, all right, the next question is from one of our live participants who would like to know, um, can you describe some of the criteria a scientist uh, or institution has to fulfill to gain access in a space telescope? Well, um, so to apply for time on a space telescope, um, and we can be talking right now about the Hubble Space Telescope or eventually when it's uh, ready for operation, the James Webb Space Telescope, you have to uh, apply through the agency that operates the telescope, and in those two cases it's NASA, although Europeans are involved in both projects, uh, so Europeans go through their own access. These major facilities also have man a manner of access that's open to all people, so you don't have to be a citizen or to live in one of the countries that produced the telescope or built it or even funded it to apply for time on it. You don't formally have to have a PhD or be a professional astronomer to apply for time on telescopes like James Webb and Hubble. Uh, but the truth is that the competition for time is so intense and the bar is so high on a successful proposal that anyone except a professional astronomer is, is hugely disadvantaged in writing a competitive proposal. So while it is an open resource uh, in principle, in practice, only professional astronomers are likely to get time. Now the Hubble has always, for the last 10 or 15 years, has had a portion of director's time. So the director of the observatory of the Space Telescope Science Institute has discretionary time, and it's a few hundred orbits, quite a significant amount. And the last few directors have been willing to give a fraction of their director's time, still dozens of orbits, uh, to amateur astronomers or citizen scientists or people who are civilians, if you like, not professional astronomers who have a really good idea and write up their case convincingly. So that's the window of opportunity for the Hubble. Uh, it's not clear if James Webb will have a similar program. Uh, and then the uh, related question, um, same from Demetrius, would like to know, um, are the configurations from one task to another, so if, when they switch from one observation to another, are those time consuming or difficult? Um, the efficiency of telescopes that are general purpose, that, do, that have a, a set of instruments, a set of operating modes, and a large number of different targets all over the sky, these are important. I mean, optimizing the efficiency of a telescope just increases its scientific productivity and increases the number of scientists that can get their projects done in a given period of time. So the mission planners put a lot of thought into how to optimize this. And so what can happen is that sometimes observations made with the same instrument mode are grouped together so that you don't have to spend time uh, changing the configuration of the instrument. Uh, unless it's a very simple change, like moving a, a single filter. Um, so that often happens. Also, slew time is significant uh, for these telescopes, and so often groupings of objects in the similar part of the sky are observed sequentially or even interleaved uh, to minimize the slew time. And that means programs are sliced and diced up so your set of targets may be observed at very different times just to optimize that. For the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, pretty early in the project, they used some kind of leading edge AI techniques to optimize the schedule. Essentially, the number of instrument modes and the number of programs that had to be scheduled was so large that, that humans could not do this efficiently or even reliably. And so they had given over for over a decade now the task of scheduling the Hubble uh, to machine learning or an AI type program, which does a really good job. Uh, the next question is from email. Hernan Reyes uh, emailed us a question about Europa. Um, 
so the it concerns the chaotic terrain on Europa in a region called Conmara Chaos has apparently been produced by local disruption of the icy crust that covers uh, this Galilean moon. Um, it looks like a jumble of rafts of ice, as if these slabs cracked and shifted position over what must have been a very long time. Uh, the, the, main, the first question is, how long does something like that take? Does it take millions of years or hundreds or thousands or tens of millions? What's the kind of time scale we're talking about for those cracks to appear? The European ice surface is subject to a lot of speculation. We, we have fairly limited inf information about it yet uh, until the Europa Clipper mission, which is a decade away from getting data. We're still basing our information based on you know missions that are decades old or telescopic observations. Um, so there's a lot of inference and there's a lot of uncertainty. However, what isn't uh, and and to answer the question directly, the best guessing about the age of the European ice pack overall is is very long, possibly 100 million, 90 or 100 million years. That's the best estimates I've read in the literature. So it's an ancient ice surface, but of course it's not static. Those rafts and jumble of icebergs and uh, sort of chaotic terrain is indicative of movement and change. Excellent. So then the um, follow-up to that question is um, how was this ice raft formed? Um, was the surface cracked somehow and then blocks of ice moved apart? Or was it, you know, because it oozed up from underneath? What's, you know, what's, what's the mechanism? Uh, the mechanism is almost certainly tidal heating. So um, the, the large moons of Jupiter, and it's a Galilean moon, of course, it's a fairly large moon, uh, about the size of the Earth moon almost, um, are subject to significant tidal heating, and that is a differential stretching force between one side of the moon and the other, which causes geological activity, and that's mild, uh, causes mild heating in the interior, and that's why so far from the sun you have heating from the rocky interior that actually can keep a liquid ocean. And that same tidal heating because Europa has an elliptical orbit, flexes the moon, and that flexing literally will break up and dislodge and cause cracks and fissures and changes to the icy surface. So it's essentially tidal, tidal forces and tidal heating that keep the upwelling of liquid from the interior. And as cracks appear and fissures, of course, the, the water can upwell and then freeze and then liquefy again and then freeze again and on top of that you have the motion caused by the tidal forces and so that explains fundamentally why you have such a chaotic and changing terrain. Um, and then finally <clears throat> what does this tell us about the actual thickness of the crust of Europa? Um, could it actually be quite thin uh, a few kilometers or hundreds of kilometers? Um, is there a way to tell from this process? The thickness of the ice pack is, of course, a huge unanswered question with a lot of speculation and some modeling behind it. And, there, and there's a lot of research and papers written about this over the last decade or so. And there's no complete consensus. So people have run all sorts of models and used the best sense of the physical conditions to estimate the probability of the thickness. Uh, a fairly recent study from a few years ago used a sort of Monte Carlo method to model all, all sorts of quantities and models. And their best guess number was about 20 kilometers, so in between the two numbers that you speculated. Uh, however, of course, there may be parts of the icy crust where just due to non-uniformities or perhaps a hot spot on the interior that's upwelling heat through the ocean and, and melting the ice from below, you could easily have areas where the thickness is only a couple of kilometers. And if you could find those, of course, that would be a very exciting place to potentially have a lander that might be able to melt through the ice pack. But generally, the thickness is several tens of kilometers. Uh, the next question is from Faisal, who's on with us live. <clears throat> Has it been proven um, or shown that there is a ninth planet? We actually have a several questions about the ninth planet. Um, so is there, is there a ninth planet that has just been found mathematically, um, or is that still complete speculation, and will the James Webb Space Telescope be able to observe things at the edge of the solar system? Well, in a sense, there are there is a ninth planet, there's a tenth, eleventh, and twelfth planet. Um, 
once we recognize that the Pluto is in a different category and it's a dwarf planet, and so the, the fully fledged planets of the solar system only number eight, then we have now found in the inner regions of the Kuiper Belt, the Kuiper Belt is the region of rocky, rocky objects extending from about 40 to 80 astronomical units, so beyond the orbit of Uranus and Neptune. Um, there are other objects similar in size to Pluto. There are a, a handful now that are within 30 percent of Pluto's size. So you could uh, call any of those Planet Nine, if you want to call them a planet, but in the sense they're all dwarf planets. They're all smaller rocky bodies uh, that may have been captured from the outer solar system, or they may be interlopers. They were not necessarily part of the formation process that led to the, the gas giant planets that we know of. Um, so people are still looking because the real estate out there is very hard to survey to particular depth because of a small object like Pluto, maybe twice as far away as Pluto is, um, is going to be extremely faint. And it could also be found at significant inclinations to the ecliptic. So that's a large swath of sky to cover. And the surveys that are looking for such objects are only about half complete. So another three to five years is needed before we have a full inventory of the Pluto-like dwarf planets out there. Uh, the next question is from Harry Bell, who's on with us live. Um, what can gamma ray astronomy tell us about dark matter, and how does it do that? Well, there was a, there's been a flurry of interest over the years in um, forms, models of dark matter. So we don't know what dark matter is, and so there are various ideas for dark matter, fundamental particles that behave in different ways. And one of the viable, still viable models for the dark matter particle a pol involves a particle that can interact with itself and under certain circumstances uh, can lead to uh, annihilation, gamma ray annihilation energy released. And so there was a claim a few years ago of an excess gamma ray signal from the center of our galaxy, not associated directly with the supermassive black hole there, that people, because it was distributed over some large region, not directly at the galactic center, and so this led to speculation that perhaps this was the dark matter in the galactic center, this gamma ray signature, and that would be indicating what kind of particle it was. That evidence has softened. The gamma ray signal from the galactic center has not gone away, but the um, strength of it so as to be attributed to dark matter of any kind is no longer so compelling, and so this has now become a kind of ambiguous area of research. Uh, the next question is from an email. Um, when looking for life in the universe, should there be a consideration of whether the body that we're looking at has a solid surface or not? Um, for astrobiology considerations, people are, of course, talking about planets and potentially moons. Um, you can have either a solid surface, or a rocky planet. Um, you can have a liquid planet, so a water world, because we know those kind of worlds exist, uh, not just like Europa, a moon in our solar system, but full, fully fledged Earth-like planets elsewhere that are likely to be completely covered in oceans. So those are the main candidates to looking for life. Uh, whether life could exist in a purely gaseous environment is completely unclear. Uh, there are forms of life, microbial life, um, ecosystems almost, that exist in circulating patterns in the stratosphere of the Earth going to very high elevations where they have a ex significant exposure to UV radiation. Um, but it's not clear that li this is life that's still tethered to the surface of the Earth and the tree of life that underlies all life on Earth. So it's not clear if you could have purely forming and evolving from scratch life in a gaseous environment. There's speculation about that, but there's no evidence for it so far. Uh, the next question is from David Gold, who's on with us live. What kind of research is being done to extend the range of identified frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, perhaps to aid in discoveries in astronomy? Um, our exploration and usage of the electromagnetic spectrum, it probably hasn't advanced that much in the last few decades. The sort of the time when the electromagnetic spectrum was broken open for astronomy happened, of course, first in the 1930s and 40s with radio astronomy, and then in the 1960s and 70s with infrared astronomy, uh, X-ray astronomy, and gamma-ray astronomy. So those, those 
broad wave bands of the electromagnetic spectrum have been open to astronomy for decades. Um, all that is really being done now is refining the type of instrument. So what's not, ha what's not really happening is expanding the wavelength range that can be covered for astronomy. What's happening is the development of new detectors that increase, sometimes dramatically, the sensitivity to detecting those waves. The natural limits to this are once you get to radio wavelengths that are longer than a few meters, um, th they become very difficult to detect with normal radio technologies. Uh, and once you get to gamma ray wavelengths that are smaller than a subatomic particle, similarly it gets very hard to detect that radiation. Also we're not sure any normal astrophysical process can produce radiation that energetic. Uh, the next question is from Karen, who is on with us live. In the three years since the course was recorded, well, so that's the astrobiology course, but it's been, <clears throat> what, five or six years um, since the original astronomy course has, was recorded. Uh, what would you say has been the most remarkable development in astronomy or astrobiology in those in the last uh, three years, let's say? Yeah, I think in astrobiology, the answer would have to be just the characterization and the estimate of the number of Earth-like worlds in the galaxy by, based on Kepler data. So the final numbers are not in from Kepler data, even though the satellites stopped taking data some years ago. Uh, analyzing it all and digging all the faint signals out of it is still ongoing. But we now have a pretty good estimate of the frequency of Earth-like or super-Earth-like planets around sun-like stars or even red dwarfs in the galaxy. And that's, a, that's an amazing number to come up with because it amounts to tens of billions of Earth-like worlds projected across the Milky Way. Uh, the next question is from Pakornan, who's on with us live. How sharp is the event horizon of a black hole? Would it be theoretically possible for an object to be partly inside like a planet? It's an interesting question. The event horizon um, is a surface. So first of all, the event horizon is a, is a, is a conceptual thing. It's not a physical surface. Um, it corresponds to the place near an intensely gravitating object where the escape velocity reaches the speed of light and where the effects of relativity are so extreme that time perceived in the, in the frame of the event horizon slows to a crawl, in fact freezes entirely, and where the gravitational redshift of a photon becomes infinite and therefore light can not escape. So in, in theory, since it is a theoretical information membrane, it hasn't got a thickness, it's just a surface, a one-dimensional thickness surface. Um, so in, in practical answer to the question, no, it's probably not possible for a, an object to be half in and half out. The next question is from one of our live participants, KP uh, Adwaith Damodaran, uh, Damodaran asks, um, our moon plays a role in supporting life on Earth. Uh, would it affect the Earth in any way if the moon was destroyed or moved from Earth? And I assume that the process of how that happened makes a difference. <laughs> right, yeah, the moon, was, uh, the moon was truly destroyed by, say, an impact. Um, that would be catastrophic or almost catastrophic for the Earth, too. But if the moon just somehow disappeared, or uh, it, it, the moon is moving away from us, but very slowly, like four centimeters a year, that's not really noticeable, of course. Um, but if the moon were to disappear for some reason, um, or leave the Earth's orbit, uh, it would have a significant effect on the Earth, of course, because the moon uh, induces tides, uh, not just water tides, but land tides, and so actually the frequency of earthquakes would decline because the moon is a significant secondary contributor to earthquakes and also the water tides would decline. Um, now that may or may not be a good thing. People who think that moons, large moons are important for the development of life uh, point to the tidal range and the tidal forces as being energy inputs and also uh, ways of applying variability to a potentially biological environment, which is usually good for biology. Biology likes a dynamic environment, both physically and chemically. So, but life is, of course, rife on the Earth and has taken every ecological niche available to it. So the loss of the moon would not have any dramatic downward effect on life on Earth. 
Uh, the next question is from Martin Zimmer, who asks, do you ever confront anti-science and anti-education campaigns meant to perpetuate ancient power structures? Well, there's a lot of misinformation out there in the world, of course, and so, yes, occasionally I encounter groups or people who come to talks and ask questions that indicate pretty high level of suspicion or antagonism towards science. Um, and, 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 and indeed, there's a sort of generic uh, issue that's a problem in the United States more than in other countries, I think, of an increasing suspicion of expertise uh, of so-called elites. And since I'm an academic scientist, I belong to one of those elites. And so some people are suspicious or skeptical of things that scientists say because they think they occupy this privileged position in the society and that they're an elite and so they're insulated from perhaps information they should hear or from the masses or who knows what. So yes, those attitudes are out there um, and you know they affect other people too, not just scientists and not just science. But I think the suspicion and the denigration of expertise is probably the most damaging thing I've seen in the culture in the United States in the last decade or so. The next question is from um, Jorge, who would like to say, who would like to ask, could you comment on the findings in the material recently recovered from asteroids? Well, what we know about asteroid samples, there's only a handful where we've done this return. Um, we're obviously waiting for the OSIRIS-REx mission to deliver a little piece of Bennu uh, that will be studied here at the University of Arizona and labs around the world. Uh, what we've learned is that this is, this is pristine solar system material, as we would anticipate. Uh, these are mostly unaltered rocks that have been uh, sitting far from the sun uh, and orbiting without modification for four and a half billion years. So it's really sort of showing us how the things of the solar system, planets and moons, were constructed from this material. It also tells us that there are significant volatile materials, frozen volatile materials like water, methane, and other ices, and significant amounts of organic material, carbon-rich material, which is a pre prelude for life and a necessity for life. So that's what we found. Nothing dramatic, not organic materials or complex molecules of, of a complexity that would have surprised a biologist or a biochemist. Uh, but definitely telling us about how the solar system formed and then indirectly about how life might have formed. Um, Pashpati Nath Dutta asks, is it true that 99.99% of the universe is made up of plasma? Um, I'm not sure if it's that, de that many decimal places, but it, absolutely it is the great majority of the universe, certainly more than 99%. Uh, and that's because most of the universe, and of course it depends whether you're talking about mass or volume. If you're talking about volume, then it is 99 with uh, several nines after the decimal place percent plasma because the intergalactic medium is very rarefied. It's uh, heated by ultraviolet radiation from stars and galaxies, and so it's kept in the plasma state. So it's a very rarefied plasma that truly occupies all the space between galaxies. But if you add up how much material that is, it's not quite as dramatic. The intergalactic medium does account for about 30% or a third, maybe slightly more, of all the baryons, the normal particles in the universe. So in that sense, the normal stuff of the universe, like we're made of and stars are made of, is also mostly plasma. Um, our next question is from the astronomer who is on with us live, who would like to know if um, life could potentially exist on planets other than Mars, but uh, we should probably address whether it can exist on Mars first. Yeah, where in the solar system could life exist is a, is a very important question that we're trying to figure out, and NASA missions are often devoted to this. It's fairly likely that life could exist on Mars right now, but not on the surface. It would have to be under the surface. We've got strong evidence, indirect very strong evidence of subsurface aquifers and uh, water that is in a liquid state even now, but it's not on the surface, tens of meters, maybe hundreds of meters down. All the ingredients are there for life, so that could certainly be the case. Beyond Mars, it's less clear. Uh, Venus is very inhospitable, and the phosphine detection 
has become controversial. So there's no strong evidence for life on Venus. The smaller, arid, rocky bodies like Mercury are almost certainly lifeless. And so then, and the large gas giant planets are also very hard to imagine life. So then we're left with a set of icy, rocky moons of the giant planets. And there's possibly a dozen of those worlds in the outer solar system that have all the ingredients for life somewhere, that have a, under the surface typically will have a local energy source, will have sufficient compression or tidal heating or radioactive heating to create liquid water under that surface, and there's plenty of organic or carbon-rich material. So those are all pos possible places where life might exist. And they, of course, include Titan and uh, uh, Europa and Enceladus and uh, some of the outer moons like Triton. All right, the next question is Miguel is from Miguel um, Araujo, who asks, from animations, it seems that JWST is orbiting around L2, which is in turn orbiting the sun. But L2 isn't a thing, uh, really. So how is this possible? What's providing this central force? Um, L2 is, is just a gravitational balance point. We're in a three-body system. Um, the the net forces of the three bodies balance out at certain points. Uh, a couple of those balance points are unstable in the sense that if an object is placed there, it will gradually drift away and then leave the system, and others are stable. L2 is an unstable Lagrange point, and so active control is needed of the telescope uh, to keep it in the Lagrange point. Um, but it's still a good place for a spacecraft because a very modest amount of energy is required to keep it there. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. Um, Jeff and Raja would like to Raja would like to know why is space dark even though there are many uh, even though there are ma many glittering stars. Yes, the darkness of space is a conundrum that um, you know occurred to astronomers as back as far as the 18th century, and it was called Albert's paradox then, which is why is the night sky dark. Because the argument was that in an infinite universe, which is the universe of Newton that, that held through into the early 20th century, um, even before he knew about galaxies, galaxies are just made of stars. So eventually, in any direction you go, eventually you'll meet a star or a galaxy. And the number of those stars and galaxies uh, goes up as the square of the distance on any surface. Uh, and the light from each of them goes down as the square of the distance. So the contribution of light from more and more distant stars and galaxies just keeps adding and adding and adding and without limit, and so it should be infinite. And so that logical problem, that simple mathematics, indicates what's called Olber's paradox. Why is the night sky dark when there's potentially an infinite amount of light and an infinite amount of gravity? And the answer to that question of why the sky is dark uh, is twofold. It partly is due to the expansion of the universe which was not known, of course, in Albert's time. It was only known with Edwin Hubble in the 1920s. Uh, that expansion of the universe reduces the energy from a distant object through the redshift. And so that means that simple energy calculation that leads to infinite energy and brightness of the sky uh, is wrong, because more distant objects are fainter than you would otherwise expect. And the other, the other part of it relates to the finite age of the universe, the distances between galaxies in the depths of space are so large that light has not had time in the 13.8 billion years the universe has been in existence to fill all the spaces between galaxies. And so for those two reasons, the sky is indeed dark. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question, um, oh, I'm sorry, I kind of got lost here. Um, so the next question from one of our uh, live participants is um, from Alishba, who asks, what are your thoughts on life on other planets or in other galaxies? Well, it's up for grabs because we have not found life beyond Earth anywhere in the solar system, beyond, in other galaxies, anywhere in the universe. So at the moment, we're it. The Earth is it. Uh, but there's some expectation that that is not the way things are because the ingredients for life exist widely in the universe. Carbon, for instance, is throughout the universe, produced by stars. It's in every galaxy we've looked at. It's in galaxies getting back close to the Big Bang. Water is one of the most abundant molecules in the universe. 
Uh, and there's plenty of energy sources for life that you don't even need the right light of a star. So given that the basic requirements of life exist so widely, that does lead people to expect that life will exist beyond the Earth. In our galaxy, and since our galaxy is not unusual, in a Copernican argument, that should be true in any other galaxy too. So astronomers do expect, without evidence for it yet, that the universe is littered with biology. Um, the next question is from Edouard Ruel, who asks, uh, how do astronomers, or how would one calculate the mass of a space object? Um, I know about the uh, Kepler's laws, but um, I read that from somehow from that rule we can calculate the mass of a planet. Can you explain how that's done? Um, sure. You, a, a truly isolated object in deep space, you can't calculate its mass at all. It's, it's only going to be able to be calculated when it's in a gravitational interaction with something else. So if it's a small object in close proximity to or whose motion is altered by or it's in orbit of a much, much larger object, then essentially you can treat uh, the small object like as a test particle where the, the mass of the large object is so much larger than the mass of the small object that you can just uh, use a simplified form of Newtonian gravity to calculate it. If the two objects are similar in mass or not vastly dissimilar in mass, then you have to use the orbital dynamics of their motions around each other, assuming they're in orbit, um, to calculate the mass of both objects. Now if the objects are just passing in the night or through the universe, not bound, then it's harder because you're actually trying to use the deflection angle or the change in trajectory of the object to infer its mass, and that's a, that's a less reliable procedure. Um, all right, uh, the next question is um, from Utkarsh Duby, who asks, can you differentiate between a pulsar and gravitational waves emitted by neutron stars? Um, well, pulsars are neutron stars. They just are neutron stars that have hot spots. Um, as far as the type of gravitational waves that they produce, uh, the gravitational waves that come from a neutron star, whether or not it also has radio emission as a pulsar, are really reflecting the change in its sort of gravitational potential. Uh, gravitational waves are produced by any gravitational changing situation. So a spinning neutron star is, of course, uh, changing. The gravity is changing as it spins. Uh, and so gravity waves fundamentally will not depend very much on whether the neutron star has hot spot and therefore is a pulsar. And so in, to, in the other way of answering that is to say that the gravity waves themselves will not tell you whether an object is also a pulsar as, as opposed to just being a bare neutron star. Uh, the next question is from <clears throat> uh, David McKenzie, who uh, sent an email asking about the Gaia Space Telescope. How long will the Gaia Space Telescope operate, and has it provided data for astrobiology, or was it de designed only to map the distance of objects? Um, Gaia is a very important mission from the European Space Agency, and it's, uh, I think, tapped two-thirds away through its mission. It's going to operate another four or five years, I think. Um, and it's an astrometric mission. It is producing exquisitely accurate uh, positions for, I think, a hundred million stars in the galaxy. So it's pr putting positions to uh, a few percent of the stars in the galaxy, uh, extending out to thousands of light years. And the positions come from e extraordinary uh, accuracy of its angular measurement uh, to about 10 or 20 micro arc seconds. That's 10 to the minus 5 arc seconds. So incredible precision. Um, its contribution to astrobiology and to exoplanets is that that level of positional measurement allows you to detect planets by, by their wobble, by astrometry itself, where a planet orbiting a star, even if the planet's not visible, will make the star oscillate just as the sun pivots about its edge uh, over a 12-year period because of Jupiter. An analogous thing will happen with stars elsewhere in the gal galaxy, and Gaia can sense that. So Gaia is expected by the end of its mission to uh, produce a list of th several thousand, I think, 
uh, exoplanets detected by astrometric methods. So it's really going to be a major contributor to the exoplanet research. Uh, the next question is from Laura, who asks, <clears throat> I have a question about mesons. How can they exist? Shouldn't they annihilate since they are a pair of matter and antimatter? Um, well, a meson is, a, is in the word, comes of course from the Greek, uh, which means intermediate mass. So they are, they're halfway between leptons, which are light particles, and baryons, which are the heavy particles. So mesons are a class of subatomic particles. Um, and they can exist in normal form and antimatter form. They're not necessarily uh, intrinsically unstable. Um, a muon is a meson, for example, uh, and, a, and muon, muons and their heavier partners are unstable. Um, but it's not actually because of it's a combination of matter and antimatter. Uh, muons typically consist of two quarks in the conjunction. Uh, the next question is from Irwin, who asks, does the Earth's moon experience significant tidal heating? And what determines the magnitude of tidal heating? Yes, uh, the tidal heating, since gravity is an equal force in both directions, it's an equation, um, just as the moon exerts a tidal force on the Earth, so the Earth exerts a tidal force on the moon. And so the moon is being flexed uh, by the Earth. But the moon is a small enough body that that amount of tidal heating is, is definitely not enough um, to cause liquefaction of the center and uh, plate tectonics or anything like that. So the Earth's tidal heating of the moon is less profound than the moon's effect on the Earth. Um, and so the Earth, the moon stays as a rocky body. It probably increases the seismic activity on the moon. The moon is not completely geologically dead and the tidal heating caused by the Earth probably is a contributor to its geological activity. The next question is um, <clears throat> from one of our live participants. Why does the Earth bulge at the equator and flatten out at the poles? Uh, poles and does this apply to all planets? Uh, sure. Uh, any spinning object um, has differential forces. So there's centrifugal force that applies in the equatorial regions, which are moving at you know, 1,200 kilometers per hour, um, as opposed to the polar regions that are not moving at all. And that naturally produces an oblate object, that is an object that's bulging at the equator. Now, it's a very subtle effect. It's less than a percent. If you held the Earth up and stared at it, you would not notice this bulge to the eye. So it's a fairly subtle effect, but it's real. And of course, the same spin also produces a tidal bulge in the water, and the water is more easily able to move than the rocky core and crust, um, so the tidal bulge is even more prominent when it comes to the water of the Earth. The next question is from DJ Curiosity, who's on with us live. Um, why is it that the large, um, that the largest telescopes take two countries, but I think they're misunderstanding uh, how many countries it actually takes to build some of these large telescopes, including the JWST? Um, there are still telescopes built by single countries, um, but the biggest, the multi-billion dollar facilities uh, strain the budgets of even the richest countries in the world. And so that, it's, it's two reasons. It's because of the enormous cost and complexity of the biggest telescopes uh, is better when it's the sh load is shared between countries. And the other reason, which is a good reason, is the international community of astronomers and scientists is very fluid and tight where um, you know, people do collaborate routinely with people in other countries. It doesn't have anything to do with the telescopes or the facilities. It's just a part of research in the modern era. And so it's very natural for people to collaborate in this way. The Hubble Space Telescope, you know, over 30 years old now, is a great example of this collaboration. It's a fr fundamentally a NASA telescope, 85%. But since its inception, a 15% of the time, and one of the instruments and a ground station and various parts of the infrastructure have been provided by the European Space Agency. And over those three decades, uh, European astronomers on average have got 15% of the time on the Hubble, while American astronomers uh, get 85%. And it's worth noting that when people say America gets 85%, that's just astronomers based in U.S. institutions. Uh, I'm a Brit, although I'm naturalized American now. 
Um, and so there are many foreign scientists working in U.S. institutions. And so when they get time on the Hubble, uh, they are U.S. scientists for the bean counting, but they're international scientists more generally. Uh, the next question is from Prabir Adhikari, who asks, how does space de debris affect future space, mi space missions? Uh, how serious is this problem, and what are the probabilities that it will impact uh, a mission in the future? It's a serious problem, and it's getting finally a little coverage and some attention from international bodies and regulatory bodies. Um, space debris is, is just getting worse. The number of satellites that are launched, all the way down to nanosatellites, um, has grown dramatically. Um, companies like SpaceX are launching constellations, which are sets of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit to try and put wireless internet into places that are in the Earth that don't have it. And so the projection is that these low Earth orbits, just with newly launched satellites, will get added another 30 or 40,000 satellites in the next five or six years, which is an enormous amount of clutter in low Earth orbit. Many of these satellites will deorbit naturally because they're at low Earth orbit and there's a very slight drag that gradually causes them to come down and burn up in the atmosphere. Sometimes they collide and they produce shrapnel or debris. Both the Russians and the Chinese have used their anti-missile uh, systems to destroy one of their own satellites, causing a lot of debris and chaos. So this is a problem that's getting worse, and the remedies are hard. They're, it's very difficult to sweep up or collect debris spread over such a large distance. The most dire scenario was um, in, predicted by someone called Kessler, I forget his first name, a couple of decades ago, and it's called the Kessler Syndrome. And this is the situation where this debris and the collisions are sufficient that you leads to a runaway effect, where you get a cascading of big things hitting into smaller things and breaking into smaller pieces until you have an exponential rise in the number of small pieces. Because remember, a piece of debris that's the size of really the head of a pin traveling at 20 or 30,000 miles an hour can puncture the wall of a spacecraft or a spacesuit. Um, I believe this has been asked by a couple of people, <clears throat> um, but uh, the next question is um, from one of our live participants. What would happen if the, if the Earth's core or any planet's core totally cooled and solidified? Yeah, I mean, the planets that have molten cores, they are gradually cooling. I mean, they're gradually radiating heat away. The sustaining of the heat is partly natural due to radioactive decay just from naturally occurring radioactive isotopes in rock. So that heat will never go away because these are very long-lived isotopes with half-lives of billions of years. But if, if hypothetically the Earth's core cooled sufficiently that the core, the, the, there's a solid core and then there's a liquid outer core, that that liquid part solidified, that would actually have quite a dramatic effect on the way the Earth functions because it's the liquid core and the differential rotation inside the Earth that leads to plate tectonics, that leads to the upwelling of magma, uh, that leads to the continents moving around, that leads to volcanism on the Earth. And so that going away would gradually um, cause the loss of that geological activity and the primary influence of that would be to actually dramatically cool the Earth. Excellent. Uh, the next question is um, from um, one of our live participants, KP, asks, do asteroids get, are they named after the names of their founders or the finders, I assume they mean? Right. Naming conventions in astronomy are, are a little hard to keep track of because people, there have been historical rules from the International Astronomical Union, the governing body of international astronomy going back 100, 150 years. And then of course there were historical names from mythology uh, that have been passed forward. Uh, for smaller objects, it's, it's hard to decide how that works. Um, so the, the largest objects, you know, Ceres of course, the largest asteroid of all, uh, that's, a, that's a classical mythology reference. The largest objects tend to have Greek or Roman mythology references, but once you get to the small ones, they can have other names, and they are indeed named after people. So there are 
Uh, there are small asteroids that are named after famous scientists, after astronomers, after um, you know major figures in history. Um, they're not supposed to be named after sort of ephemeral people in the popular culture, but that could happen, um, I suppose. Uh, Frank Zappa had an asteroid named after him, and so there are other people that are in the media world that have had asteroids named after them. Uh, and uh, I think it's hard to enforce the rules once you get to the very small objects. Uh, the next question is from Girish, who asks, what will happen if a black hole and a neutron star collide with each other? Well, um, LIGO has actually already seen this. So among the things that LIGO has detected are black hole mergers or collisions uh, and neutron star, neutron star collisions and also neutron star black hole collisions or mergers. And, and when that happens, the objects combine um, the neutron star, of course, is subsumed into the black hole, and the, and the end result is a somewhat bigger black hole. It's not as simple as the addition of the mass of the two objects, because a significant fraction of the rest mass of the combined object is emitted as actual gravitational radiation itself, which is extraordinary. Um, but the result is indeed a, a bigger object that is a black hole and a lot of gravitational radiation. Uh, the next question is from Shrusti, who asks, uh, can we artificially create a black hole? Uh, no, our technology is insufficient to do that. There have been scares every now and then that CERN, through its collisions of subatomic particles, could create instantaneous density sufficient to make a microscopic black hole, or that the same thing might happen at the um, laser facility at Los Alamos, or places where a large amount of energy and pressure is put into a small region. Uh, so these facilities, these physicists have had to reassure the public that they're, uh, they're, these tools of physics are not able to make black holes. And, and actually we're very far away from creating even a microscopic black hole. Um, not a factor of five or ten, but many orders of magnitude. So our technology is completely inadequate to create a black hole right now. Next question is, several people have actually asked this, but Dr. Mom asks, about intelligent life outside Earth, um, how much is it a possibility mathematically and how long um, will it take um, for mankind to reach the point where we can uh, contact life, intelligent life? The problem is, for intelligent life uh, beyond the Earth, the problem is the application of mathematics doesn't work. It would be nice if it did, but it doesn't. All we have going into this estimation or calculation is the raw material, that is the number of Earth-like potentially habitable planets. That's a number that astronomy has come up with in the last few years, thanks primarily to the Kepler satellite. But as for the fraction of those potentially habitable worlds that actually get biology, or the fraction of those where the biology evolves and develops intelligence, um, that's completely unknown. So unfortunately, math doesn't help you in that situation because we have no other examples to base our calculation on. We have our example of one, and we have a great uncertainty as to the mechanisms in evolution by which evolution goes towards intelligence. Or we have uncertainty as to how often a habitable planet actually develops biology. The majority of them, most of them, m might not, or most of them might. We simply don't know. So unfortunately, that situation isn't really going to change very much. And yet people will do the scientific experiment of trying to look for intelligent life because you know, if you found it, it would allow you to make that calculation for the first time. All right, it is 11.03, and our time is nearing an end. Um, we had, fortunately, we had a lot of people here today, 181 at the maximum. Wow. So thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to get to every question, um, but we will end with this one um, from Wakar, um, and perhaps you can kind of expound on this a little bit. Um, um, but they ask, will JWST bring a revolution in the field of astronomy? So perhaps you can talk generally about what we can expect from JWST and what its goals are. Yeah, James Webb, in a nutshell, is is the largest, most powerful space telescope ever built, also the most complex and expensive. Um, it's primarily an infrared telescope, uh, as opposed to Hubble, which was an ultraviolet and optical telescope. 
So James Webb is working at longer wavelengths, mostly at wavelengths longer than a micron. Those are waves about two to three times longer than the waves that the eye is most sensitive to. Uh, that kind of an infrared telescope is good at certain things and not good at others. Its revolutionary abilities are going to involve seeing to the center of our galaxy, for example, where there's a supermassive black hole, seeing to the centers of dark clouds where stars are forming and telling us a lot more about how the process of star formation actually works in these dusty, uh, concealed regions. And then, of course, it will study exoplanets and it will try and find habitability of exoplanets based on biomarkers or oh, we've got a <laughs> my apologies I'll have to figure out how to turn that down um, so it will f it will do some exoplanet research and then of course its other primary goal actually when it was designed was to find the oldest stars and galaxies or the first stars and galaxies in the universe and that will be revolutionary because that'll fill in a bit of the story of the universe that we just have been guessing about so far. Okay, that was a good one to end with. And uh, thank you all for your interest and your very varied and excellent questions. Thanks to Matthew for facilitating. And I think we have another couple on the books um, of live sessions. So we'll see you again in a few weeks. Yes, the next uh, live session will be uh, February th now I've forgotten. I was I was sure of it, and then I'm now I'm unsure again. I'm February second or fourth, the no, Wednesday. It won't be fourth because I'm gone. So, okay, so February second is yeah. is more likely. Um, yes, yeah, so February second, that is the correct one, um, and then the one after that will be February twenty fourth. So we are going to see everybody then. I also posted a link to the Google Calendar if you'd like to follow along um, with that. Um, thank you all for joining us again today. We hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week, and we will uh, be with you again in two weeks. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye, everyone.